transitioning, we talked about a booting process, how Linda's boots. Uh, I want to I wanna jump in and, and spring right off of that. We, we've learned that the motherboard has firmware on it, so you have a chip, and this is typically called the PC BIOS. And this firmware has software that initializes the motherboard, it looks for a bootable device, and then begins to boot to it. We, we learn that it goes to a hard drive and goes to the first sector. The first sector is what we call the master boot record. Very good, the master boot record. And in the master boot record, and this is very, very important, this process that I'm describing to you has been the way we have booted operating systems for the last 20 years. We have not changed. This is the same old way. Uh, the technology that we have used to develop the biases and the booting process to the master boot record is the same process we've been using. Here's, here's the problem. This is very old. This is 20 plus years old. So is that old technology? Mm -hmm. yes. yes. The master boot record concept, and remember this holds uh, partition table. This partition table is running out of life, okay? So this is embedded, this is part of the master boot record, and it's just a very small space in which we can describe the disk. So a couple of problems are, are coming about. One, we've got to get rid of, we've got to get rid of this. So this is being attacked by a new technology. Let's call this. So we're going to redesign this firmware. And this is going to come up with UEFI. So the first change in 20 years to the PC BIOS is now being, is now being developed by UEFI. This organization is developing the standard for a brand new booting bias, a brand new, what we call a bootloader, okay? The other problem is this partition table inside of the master boot record. The partition table cannot handle large hard drives. In fact, it maxes out at about two terabytes. So this whole partition table that's always been what we've used to describe the hard disk is now very, very old, and we're going to have to get rid of it. So, what are we going to do about it? We are going to replace this old partition table for a new one, and it's called GPT. So GPT is going to be a new partitioning system uh, and we're going, to in, we're going to cause these two technologies to work together so UEFI will work hand in hand with the new GPT partitioning system. Are we there? Yes. So guess what? You've got to know in the CompTIA exam, you've got to understand both. You've got to start getting comfortable with what UEFI is. UEFI is the new technology that's going to replace the bias. The old PC bias uh, that has been around for 20 years is moving off the scenes. And what's coming and replacing it is a update, a total redesign of how the PC boots. So we're going to have some really new things. We're going to talk about them probably Wednesday. We'll go into UEFI. Why are we changing this? Why are we moving away from this PC bias um, design? But one of our big problems that we're facing is the partition table that's in the master boot record. It simply is not keeping up with technology. So we're going to be moving to GPT. So GPT is going to allow us a lot of new technology, handling a lot bigger disks, all kinds of volumes, all kinds of technologies that we're going to see in, in the near future. Okay? So that's what's happening right now. We're seeing motherboards that are UEFI based, not PC BIOS based. All of our operating systems since Windows 7 
now support, listen carefully, they all support what? <laughs> now, the, the, big, the big issue is how many operating systems, listen carefully, will boot? A lot of motherboard manufacturers have already went UEFI. And if you go UEFI, you are already using GPT disk structure. The problem is Microsoft's Windows 7, I think XP even can read a GPT. Uh, Windows 7, Vista, Windows 8, all read and write to GPT partitions. When we come to booting that operating system, only 64-bit. So none of the 32-bit, if you got 32-bit Vista, it won't boot. But it will read it and write to it, okay? So if your disk is D drive, yes, and you partitioned it with GPT, Vista will read it fine and happy with it. But it won't boot unless it's 64-bit. So just keep it. You need to start becoming aware of this. Need what operating systems work? Will boot with GPT? What will almost all of them will read it and write to it. So if it's your D, E, F drive, you're fine. But if it's uh, the bootable drive, if it's C, then you have to be more careful. It's probably going to have to be a 64-bit version. So this is also known as the GUI partition table. Listen to me very careful. This is global unique identifier. One of the things that we want to start doing with all of our operating systems is assign a unique identifier to everything. Listen to me carefully. Operating systems are getting very complex. And the way that Microsoft and Linux and, and the <coughs> Apple operating system can maintain uniqueness to everything it knows is assign everything a unique identifier. So now we're going to be assigning partitions, uh, hard drives, everything in the operating system will come with a unique, global unique identifier. So the GPT is a new partitioning system that's going to allow huge hard drives, no limit, uh, all of the Linux variants out there support GPT. And all the Linux will boot to GPT. The only, uh, the only operating systems that are really dragging their feet are really the uh, Microsoft. So let's take a look. Here's 32-bit Windows. You can see the column that shows how many um, support boot 32-bit. Okay. Will they read it and write to it? Yeah, all but probably uh, XP. I guess XP is not in there. Now let's go to 64-bit. What happens when we go to 64? Ah, look carefully. So, uh, Server 2003, yes. Uh, Vista uh, will boot to it, but you require a different BIOS. Everyone see that? Require the UEFI, not the normal PC BIOS. So if you have Server 2008, uh, we'll boot to it without a special bias. Of course, that's the IT. Remember, we'll see that IA64? You need to know what these are. This is a 64-bit. This version of Windows is designed for the Itanium 64. So you all need to know what these designations are. So we can see that Vista 64 will boot to a GPT partition as long as the bias is? Yeah, so there's, there's kind of where we're going. Linux, by and large, Linux just works. So that's, a, that's Microsoft is not as uh, up to speed on that as everybody else. Almost all of your Linux versions, you can see the various Linux versions, both Linux OS X, uh, BCD, Free BCD, Solaris, uh, most of them will boot right up to a GPT partition. Everybody comfortable with, them, with, with what we I've just shown? These are the areas of technology. It used to be in the master boot record was a partition table. That is going away. We are now adding GPT, global part uh, the GUID uh, partition system. So we have a 
we can manage much larger hard drives, much larger volumes, much larger partitions, okay? And we're going to get rid of the PC bias and we're going to move to what? Okay, that's very, very important. But in the meantime, we need to understand this. And I'll go back. I want you to look at this. This is going to be required of you in the CompU exam. Let's take a look at this picture. This is the old master boot record partitioning system. You have to know this. Number one, with the master boot record partitioning system, the old style, you could have two type of hard drives. You could have a primary partition, I'm sorry, a primary partition and and a what? That is very important. Now listen carefully. I want you to write down primary partition. Write it down. You can have up to four. This is what you got to know for the CompTIA. You can have up to four primary partitions in the old PC BIOS master boot record partition system. You can have up to four primary partitions. You could have one, only one, extended partition. Once you created an extended partition, then you created logical partitions. Everybody there? Every one of these logical partitions you could assign a drive letter. So this could be a G, F, H, I, J, K, and you could make as many logical partitions as you wanted it, as long as you had drive letters. So this is very old. I hate to even talk about it, except you can see CompTIA questions that ask you and expect you to understand it. So let's quickly go back to my uh, drawings here, and let me, let me kind of sketch out things you really need to know. Number one, with the old PC bias, you can take a hard drive. Remember, this is the physical disk. But with the old master boot record partitioning scheme, you always had to have a primary partition. You must have a primary partition. One, at least one. And in most cases, In most cases, you actually made your whole hard drive a primary partition, okay? This also had to be active. This is going to be the bootable partition. We talked about how funky this gets in Windows 7, Windows 8, and Vista. We talked about that last week. I know that was before the Super Bowl, and it's all erased. But I videotaped it so you can go back and refresh your memory. So you without you have to have one primary partition and it must be active in order to what? Gotta have that. You gotta have a primary partition and it's gotta be set to be active. Now you can create up to a max of four part uh, you can have a, a maximum of four primary partitions. A maximum. Now, if you so desire, and uh, the need for this has really went away, but there was a day when we did this. You could actually create an extended partition, only one. You could only create one extended partition. So you could create a maximum of one extended partition, and inside, you could create logical drives. They acted just like any other partition. These were logical, and they were inside a what? Extended. Yeah. You say, Mr. Interpol, that seems so weird and strange and bizarre. Why would you ever need that? It was, it was a needed design way back 20 years ago. 20 years ago, it was really handy to have this partitioning scheme. We don't use it anymore. Today, typically, you create one primary partition, you make it active, and you boot to it. Yes? 
except, and you remember last week we talked about Windows now by default, if you pop in the Windows 7 CD, it's going to create how many partitions? Two. Right. And this one is going to be the primary, active, and it's going to be the system, right? Remember we talked about how backward this was? And this one's going to be a primary, and it is not going to be active. This one's going to be active, and this one's going to be the what? Yes? This is where, and I just, I hate to do this. This is where your boot files are, and this is where your Windows files are. It's almost like, isn't that backwards? Yes. It is very backwards, okay? So remember, this is the way we're doing it with Windows 7, Windows 8, Windows 8.1. Uh, we're doing it this way. This is the active primary partition. This is a secondary primary partition, but this is what you all know as C drive. By the way, I was looking, doing a little bit of research on the drive swap. Remember I told you how it boots to this drive, and this is actually what drive? C drive. C drive. And then as the system boots, it swaps drive letters. This swapping is actually done in the registry. So when we start the boot process, this is becoming C. But once the operating system begins to load and the registry is read and interpreted, the drive swapping is taking place. So there is registry settings that actually make this all happen. It's actually transparent to you. Occasionally, for example, if you have to break a mirrored set, there are times where you have to go in there on a server and actually go into the registry and hack the registry. You don't want to go there, okay? It's ugly. But you can do it. Microsoft does have a TechNet note to do it. But uh, as strange as it seems, this is how it works. All right, so now I want to talk about file systems. Once we partition this hard drive, we've got to put a file system on it. So let's, let's start with file systems. File systems are basically a couple file systems. One, there's FAT32, there's NTFS, there's HPF Plus, which is used by the Mac OS, and there's Extended 3, which is used by Linux, most Linux. So this is the OS X. This is all Windows. Uh, the Mac will also read, so the OS X will also read FAT32. This is why all your flash drives, listen, all your flash drives are have a file system of what? FAT32. FAT32, why? Because if you have the Mac, your OS will read the flash drive as well as Windows, okay? Yes? Yes. First thing you want to do when you get a flash drive is convert it to NFS. Because FAT32 is a cruddy file, file system. Okay? Right. A couple things to remember about file systems. File systems are all about um, allowing the storage, listen carefully, the storage and retrieval of data. So the FAT32 file system, the NTFS file system, the HPF, um, uh, the HPS, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, HPS Plus, this is the file system for the OS X, the Mac uses this, Extended 3, there's a number of variations, there's Extended 2, Extended 3, Extended 4, uh, variations of file systems for the Linux, depending on which one you use. Um, couple things to remember. These file systems allow data storage and retrieval. Okay? They allow data storage and retrieval. Second thing that you want to understand about file systems 
is that they have a couple similarities. One, how they deal with file names, how they deal with directories, also how they deal with metadata. This is very important. Uh, one of the longest serial killers in the uh, Kansas City area, uh, he had been terrorizing the Kansas City area and had killed I don't know how many people. And they found him finally uh, after almost 20 years of him hiding, never coming to the surface, kind of staying low. They never did capture him. They killed I don't know how many people. And then 20 years later, there was an article in the paper about him. And this guy sent a floppy disk to a newspaper and said, I'm still alive and well. Oh my God. OK? And they went into this. And they found out exactly where he was, exactly who he was, and they went right to him and arrested him. So 20 years after he committed all of his crimes, he had sent a floppy disk, and because file systems keep metadata, it was the metadata that nailed him. All right, so file systems, once we create these partitions, once we create these uh, disk spaces, let's say this is um, I want to I wanna lay down my data. Once I create my partition, then I have to choose one of these file systems so that I can uh, lay my data down, store it, retrieve it, um, and all of that. So that's what file systems are about, allowing the data storage and retrieval. They usually have characteristics on how they deal with file names, directories, and meta metadata. So we're going to focus on NTFS. And we'll take a look at the OSX and Linux. First of all, there are, um, when it comes to file names, this is very important, there are two categories, what we call case sensitive. And case preserving. I need you to listen. This is important. Or we can have case unsensitive and case preserving. This is very important. For example, NTFS is, is case unsensitive, but case preserving. That means I can write capital, uh, capital letters and small letters, whatever my, uh, I can use uppercase and lowercase, the file system will preserve in the file system whichever, if I choose a capital A or a lowercase a, it will preserve it, yes? But it doesn't care, it is unsensitive to case. So when I type in a command, I could type in the copy command in all capital letters or all lowercase letters. Does the command work? Yes. Yes, yes. it's case insensitive. On the other hand, when you go to Linux and you, you use Extended 3, one of the biggest struggles with moving from Windows to Linux is Linux is case sensitive and case preserving. So however you type the letters, uppercase, lowercase, it preserves that in the file system, yes? And when you type a command and the first letter must be capitalized, you must what with that first letter? Capitalized. Or it won't work. That is very frustrating for the Windows tech when he moves to Linux because everything is case sensitive. Everything. Nothing works without case sensitivity. So this is a big difference in file systems. Now, 
the HP, um, I'm sorry, the um, HPS Plus, which is used by the Mac OS X, that is like Windows. It is case insensitive, case preserving. So when you go to the Mac operating system, you're fine. It acts just like Windows. Okay? But if you go to Linux, it is absolutely so irritating because you're so not used to being case sensitive. Everything is case sensitive in Linux. Okay? So it so be aware that these operating systems, one of the most irritating features about moving from Windows to Linux is the case sensitive uh, feature of the file system. Okay? So if you go to a Mac, it's case insensitive but case preserving. It will save your uppercase, lowercase, uh, but it doesn't care when we run utilities and commands. Yes? yes. That's big. That's big, big, big. All right, file systems, I want to introduce you to one other, uh, actually two more file systems. One is called the ISO 9660. The ISO 9600 is called the CD-ROM <laughs> file system. That is used on your CD-ROM to store files, directories, because remember, CD-ROMs were audio. You guys don't remember back in those days, okay? CD-ROMs never were designed to hold data. CD-ROMs were designed to hold what? Music. And so there was an effort, a desire by Microsoft and many other operating systems, this is a great technology. We would like to save files, not music. Yes? So they had to create a file system. It was called ISO 9. 660, and it is why you can take a CD-ROM and burn data to it. All right, one more. It's called ISO IEC 13346. This is the file system for DVDs and Blu-rays, which you all love now. So now we're using a file system for Blu-rays and DVDs. This is the file system that allows us to format the, the disc, put data on it, not movies, data on it. Okay. So that is the file system that we typically we use. You're going to, uh, this is, uh, so this is very important. This is the file system that we use for CD-ROMs. And this is the file system that you use for DVDs and Blu-rays. All right. I want to show you metadata. So let's go take a look at NTFS. When I open up Explorer, Explorer shows me my hard drive. Here, let's see it. I'm going to go to my C drive. Actually, I'm going to go to my... Documents, you can see all my documents. I want you to uh, start noticing what is metadata, Mr. Vanderpool. Well, uh, what file systems do is not only do they record the name of the directories and the files, and they record them in different languages. You can use Spanish, <coughs> Greek, all the different languages. They support all different languages. But they also support what else? What is right here? Well, what about this? Time. They also give me more information about this. This is all metadata. So not only does a file system give me the ability to say the date the file was created, the date, the, uh, the time the file was created, uh, I can even do this. I want you to watch very carefully what I'm going to do. Notice up here where I'm at. Notice where my my mouse is. I'm going to right mouse click, and I want you to see the drop down menu. Everyone see this? Mm -hmm. What is this? Is that metadata? That's metadata. What you don't realize is Microsoft, the operating systems today, are allowing you to keep massive, massive amount of metadata for every file you save. Let me show you. You don't believe it? Right now we can see that 
I am only displaying in Explorer three items of metadata. Date modified, the type of the file, and the size. Could I continue checking these? Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, but just to give you an idea of how much metadata is saved and why we were able to catch a serial killer <coughs> after 20 years is because look at all the metadata my file system can save about a file. Can I save stuff? A little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Is there anything about the file that I can't save? That's metadata. That's some, listen, that's only some of the metadata you can attach to every file. You can attach music, the, the author, the musician, the title, the tracks, the length of the movie, um, and just on and on, the phone number. <laughs> Everything, everything you could ever want to know about a file can be saved in metadata. Also, let me come up here. If I come up to attributes, I'm going to show you some additional metadata. There's even subgroups. So I'm going to slide this over. Everyone see that I've got a new attribute yeah. column here? So now I even have more metadata. Because this is telling me this right here is a directory. This is a directory. This is a hidden system directory, and it's giving me more attributes. So metadata can be file attributes, information about the file, and on the author, the owner, permissions. All of this is metadata saved by the file system. It is incredibly complex. Now, let's, let me show you some more. So I'm going to take this particular file, and I'm going to open up Go Properties. And now, I even have permissions. So you can see that file systems can, can record permissions to the file. They can save enormous amounts of metadata date, time, when it was created, when it was modified, who owns the file, who created the file, on and on and on. It's amazing the amount of information that you can learn just from the metadata. This is why a lot, listen to me carefully, a lot of, a lot of hackers have attacked this metadata. So for example, if a bank saves a document or sends it via email, guess what goes with the document? The metadata. A lot of metadata. And in fact, it even had confidential information in the document. So now today, a lot of your word processors will actually give you the option of removing and eradicating any metadata from the document. Because a lot of the data in the document is also stored in the file system, and vice versa. And it can even have confidential information. Do you need to know about that? Yeah. Oh yeah, you're the IT pros. You need to know what's going out of your organization and in your organization. So if you'll notice, I'll show you Word. Word actually has some permissions that allow you to remove all metadata from the document. And that document, that information can also go in the file system. So here we see the file system is responsible for permissions. Who can see this file? What can they do if they do have rights to it? What rights are we going to give them? So all of this control is provided by the file system. So when they added a, the file system to the CD-ROMs, one of the big problems was they weren't bootable. We couldn't boot to a CD-ROM. So uh, we understood that in hard drives, in order to boot to a hard drive, we had to have what? Okay, a master boot record. 
Then we had to have a partition table. We had to have a boot sector, right? The problem was we that was well defined and well designed in hard drives. But when it came to the CD-ROM, there was there no one had designed it. No one had figured this out. So a couple of engineers, a guy from Phoenix Technologies and IBM, began to go to a Mexican rest restaurant called El Torito. And they would go after work, every, every uh, after work, and they would sit in that restaurant, and they would ponder, how can we build in this CD-ROM the structures so it looks like a hard drive, and we can make a bootable CD-ROM. And so an extension was added to the ISO 9660 standard, and it was called El Torito. <laughs> so the El Torito restaurant is infamous. So they modified the standard so that there was a MBR, there was a partition table, and then there was a boot sector. And once they designed the extension called the El Torito extension to that file system, voila, the world of bootable CDs came up. Now listen carefully. The first versions of bootable CD-ROMs always booted up like a floppy disk. So the very first variations, as we started using these bootable CDs, it was really cool. Uh, the first ones that came out acted like a floppy disk. You don't even know what a floppy disk is. They acted like a floppy disk. But they continued to work on it, and so now you can boot a CD-ROM and see the entire CD-ROM file system. 